Compass Publishing. Hi, good morning, everybody. I hope uh, everybody around the world is uh, doing well today, this morning, or this evening, where what whatever time it is where you are. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, vocabulary. It's a important topic, I think, for all teachers and all students. And I hope you uh, learn something from this presentation. And if you have any questions, you can just put them in the uh, the chat the chat. Uh, room on the side of the, the screen or if you're a little shy you want to ask me something privately there's actually a link for a Google form in the uh, in, in the comment the uh, description bar underneath the uh, underneath the uh, the window here so you can do it that way um, anyway if uh, if you're ready let's begin the seminar is going to last about 50 minutes and I'm going to ask some questions uh, throughout the presentation, so uh, I'll be asking for your input, so listen carefully and participate. Yeah. So my presentation is called Supercharging Vocabulary Learning. It's a very dramatic title. So if we think about uh, words and vocabulary, they seem to be the most important kind of conveyors of meaning. They, they seem to be, in language, they seem to be the most important element. For example, if we just present like a vocabulary element by itself without any grammar elements, we can express some kind of meaning, like the example calculator. You can guess what the person means. Maybe they're asking for a calculator or they want to borrow your calculator. There's no grammar elements that you need to help you or something like tomorrow, library, friends. The, the message is pretty clear even though there's no kind of grammar elements, there's no subtlety to the message and maybe this kind of message could be considered a little rude or impolite but the meaning that you can get the basic meaning and you couldn't really do that with just grammar elements in, in the language. You couldn't for example say the or so and have, have it be some kind of intelligible uh, message. So it's kind of tempting to think that as English teachers, um, you know, the more uh, words we're able to teach to our students, the better they'll be able to communicate. That's sort of the tempting idea here. But the problem is there's so many words. There's 170,000 uh, words in common use in the English language. And it's not clear, you know, what order we should teach them in. And also, it's really hard for students to learn vocabulary. I don't know if any of you have learned languages apart from your mother tongue, but just kind of retaining the vocabulary in your memory is really hard. At least it is for me. I don't know. Maybe some people have some tricks for, uh, for learning. So this is the dilemma that we're in. They, vocabulary seems like a really important element in, voca in, in language learning. But there's so many words to learn, and it's hard to remember them. So because it's so important, there's, uh, you know, there's a very kind of clear uh, correlation between the, the amount of vocabulary that pe students, uh, students have, that, uh, how they've learned, and their ability to read, and their ability to, to communicate uh, in general in the language. But the problem is in the classroom, there isn't a lot of sort of systematic vocabulary building and systematic vocabulary skills building especially. So that's what I really wanted to focus on uh, today in our seminar. So I wanted to open this up to you. How, how do you, in your, in your classroom, how do you help students to develop their vocabularies? Maybe I'll just give you a couple of seconds to, to write an answer. What, what do you do in the classroom to develop your students' vocabularies? Any ideas? Don't be shy. 
<laughs> well, if we don't have any ideas from the audience, I'll continue anyway. I'll, I'll let you know what I think. So uh, I wanted to focus on three separate uh, areas of focus. Uh, one is about teaching the right words. The other one is about using effective teaching principles. Oh, we got some ideas like flashcards. Yeah, using flashcards. This is, this is a very common technique. Word search puzzles, crossword games. Yeah, there's lots of ideas here. Word matching. Yeah, there's lots of activities that we can do. Um, this, is, this is one way to, to teach vocabulary. So I wanted to focus on three sort of areas. Which words, which words do we teach? Like how to choose the vocabulary that you teach your students. Um, how to present it and how to, how to, how to teach it. So it, it, uh, effective teaching principles. And also about helping students to learn actual skills. And we'll talk about what that means vocabulary skills. So first, teaching the right words. So what do we mean by the right words? So when we think about which words to teach our students, you know, like if you're reading a passage, uh, especially authentic texts, if you're reading a passage, there might be 10 or 20 words in a passage that students don't know. That doesn't mean that it's necessarily a good idea to teach all of those words. You should teach words, of course, that are really critical to the meaning of the, the passage so that they can get the general sense. But you don't have to teach 100%. It's better to choose to consider kind of two different elements. One is the needs of the learner, and then also the usefulness of the vocabulary items. So when we think about the needs of the learner, we should think about what their future is as, as a learner. How, what, what is the purpose for learning English? So actually, if we look at uh, corpus studies, that means studies of uh, you know, big collections of words, collections of uh, written text or spoken text, where they've analyzed it according to the, uh, the word families. If we look at corpus studies, we actually can see that there's a very relatively small number of words that are used in most writing. Um, Paul Nation, who's uh, um, somebody that I've read a lot about and uh, I'm a big fan of, he says that about 2,000 words cover 80% uh, of general purpose text. So if, you, if your student knows about 2,000 words, they can understand 80% of most texts. So we can get um, a good source for, for words for students like this is the general service list or the new general service list. You can find those online. And that's enough for most students, students that are learning the language for travel or for even for work. But if students are going to an academic setting, if they're going to university, especially in a foreign country, they're going to need a uh, more specialized kind of vocabulary. They're going to need um, words that are related to academic language. And a good source for those words is the academic word list, the AWL as it's called. That's a list of 570 words by Professor Avril Coxhead from New Zealand. That's something else you can find online. Both of these resources are available for free online. When we're talking about the, the usefulness of the words that we're teaching our, our students, one thing we should think about is frequency. Obviously, students should learn words that appear frequently in, in language, especially for uh, beginner readers, for beginner learners. High frequency vocabulary is going to help them to you know, generally understand. It's going to give them a good foundation for their, their language learning, and it's going to help them give them sort of leverage to understand uh, written English and spoken English. So um, mastery of these words 
kind of facilitates language learning in general. It's going to give them a, a, a leg up for their language learning. The main reason is teachers can give them definitions in, in, in English as well, and it creates what we call the web of meaning. The web of meaning means the kind of interrelation between different words. So if the student gets a definition for like pine, pine is a kind of tree that has needles. Then those three words, pine, tree, needles, those are all kind of associated with each other. And by building up that kind of those interrelations, they develop this kind of web of meaning and that helps their, their language learning a lot. So uh, again, from Paul Nation, this, I got this, these statistics. So if they have just 100 words, they understand about 50% of most English texts. And the, the next 200 words, they have about 90% of the material up to the grade, grade three level. And if they have 500 words, they have about 90% of the material up to grade nine. So you can see that frequency is a kind of good, good benchmark for you know, how useful words are for, for people to learn, for students to learn. And there are lists on the internet that you can find about, there's even one on Wikipedia. Um, that you can find for the, the, the top 100 words, most pop frequent 100 words, 200 words, 300 words. So we talked about which words to learn, which words to teach your students. So the ones that are uh, related to their, their trajectory in, in their learning, either general English or academic English, and also high frequency words. Next, I wanted to turn to effective teaching principles. So um, there's a few things that I wanted to talk about here. This is all about you know, how, to, how to teach you know, when you set aside time in the classroom for teaching vocabulary. How do you do that? What, what are you actually doing? So there's a few kind of basic principles that we should keep in mind. One is just very few unknown words at a time. One thing that I see a lot of around here, I don't know about in your country, but on the, uh, the subway or the bus, I always see university students with big long lists of vocabulary. And they've got the Korean on one side and the English on the other side. And they're, they're trying to memorize the whole list. And I always feel kind of bad for them because I know, as, as a language learner, I know that this is not really effective. Usually they're just studying for the, the test, and after the test, it's gone from their memory. So when we focus on vocabulary learning, we should try to limit the number of, of words, un, unknown words that we're teaching. Kind of less is more. Um, and memorizing those long lists of vocabulary is really ineffective for kind of long-term long -term, um, memory, long-term retention of vocabulary. The benchmark that I kind of stick to is uh, for younger learners, about six to eight words is ideal. For very young learners, even four is enough. But for older students, like in, in uh, high school university, maybe 10 to 12 at at a time is enough. So few unknown words. Also repeated exposure. Just seeing a word once, getting exposed to it once on one day and then never again, they're not going to remember it. So what we need to do is uh, space out the repetition. Maybe you know the next day it could be reviewed or in two days, three days it can be reviewed again. So spaced repetition, preferably a few days apart, and in different kind of modalities. What does that mean? Well, maybe one day they read it, another day they hear it, another day they are, it, it is elicited from them. You ask them a question, make a sentence with this, this word. The reason we want to present it in many different contexts and di many different modalities is because it enriches their understanding. You can kind of think of it like this. They're seeing that one word from many different perspectives. In, by seeing it in different contexts, they get kind of different, different orientations to the word, different perspectives on the word. So that en enhances their understanding of the word and also their 
retention of the word. So we have few no unknown words, we have repeated exposure. The third point is deliberate attention. We shouldn't just teach vocabulary sort of in passing, like we shouldn't have a, re a reading passage and, oh, this word came up, so we'll just deal with it and then move on to the rest of the reading. What we need is kind of a period of time in class where we spend, we focus on, we spend deliberate attention um, on vocabulary building. And that should be done in the classroom and also at home. They should spend, spend time learning vocabulary. And words should be treated kind of one by one, spend time one, one by one and do this kind of teaching cycle, which we'll talk about next. So just in terms of teaching techniques, we, we can kind of break, break the you know, vocabulary teaching into two main parts. One is the presentation of vocabulary items, and the second one is the practice of vocabulary items. So when we talk about presentation, we want to make sure that we don't use L1. I know it's for, if, you're, uh, if your native language is not English, and you're, you speak the same language as your students, it's very tempting to just give them a translation instead of a definition. Um, it's easy, but it's not very effective. The reason is that web of meaning. You know, we want to start building that as, as early as possible in their learning career, you know, when they're, when they're young. When they're getting definitions in, in English, they're building up that web of meaning and they're building up their, their their knowledge of other words and how they're related to each other. So don't use L1. Uh, try to use English as much as possible. Instead of L L1, you could give them clues, different kinds of clues. You could use pictures or miming or drawing on the board or maybe a timeline if you want to teach words that are related to time like yesterday, tomorrow. Or you could give them examples so there's lots of other options besides L1. When we're doing presentation, this is also our opportunity for teaching vocabulary skills. Excuse me just for a minute. What I mean by that is if you see a word, for, for example, you see a word that is built up out of a prefix and a root and a suffix, you can teach them that prefix or suffix as part of the vocabulary teaching. For example, if you say, if you see unpredictable, you could teach them un, un means not, or you could teach them also able, meaning to be able to, to be capable of doing something. It's also really effective if you can teach, if you can present words that are related in some way. Maybe they're all nouns or they're all adjectives, or they're all related to some kind of um, scene, some kind of uh, environment that they might be in, like at the bank or at the doctor's office. Or maybe they're all related to one particular topic, like toys or animals. So grouping vocabulary in that way helps with retention. There's not a lot of research that backs this up, but just in my own experience as a language learner, I've, I've found that to be true. I don't know about your experience. So that's about presentation. A little bit about practice. So uh, we need to give them opportunities to use the words. I don't know about you as a language learner, if you've ever experienced this, but as soon as you start using a word, you remember it much more, much more easily. So we need to present, to give them opportunities to practice in a variety of different contexts and different modalities. Maybe we ask them to say the word, we ask them to, to write a sentence in the word with, or maybe we ask them to unscramble the letters or fill in the blanks. There's lots of different ways that we can get them to use words. And we need to think about what we call restricted use activities and authentic use activities. I'm going to explain a little bit about what that means uh, in a minute. But basically we want to move from more restricted activities where the, the, um, the kind of language they're using is very limited or controlled to more sort of free and you know, expressive language.
One thing to keep in mind also is this sort of new word routine, this sort of teaching routine. Um, this is just the order that I do things in. Maybe it could, you, I've seen different, different routines as well. But these three elements should always be part of your, your vocabulary teaching routine. Um, first of all, define, define the word, give a definition in L1 as we talked about before. That doesn't mean a dictionary definition. I don't think that's really necessary when you're a language learner. The best idea is to give them enough, of a, enough clues with pictures or miming or um, you know, diagrams on the board or acting out or examples. Give them enough clues so they get the general idea of the word. That's the most important thing. I think to give them a dictionary definition, in some cases it may confuse them, especially when you're teaching certain very tricky words like, like B. How are you going to define B? Um, so defining the word first, then using the word, using the word in a sentence, and then eliciting the word. So getting the student to say something related to the word. So for example, you might do something like this. Um, so a pine tree is a tree that has needles instead of leaves. So. Um, a Christmas tree is a kind of pine tree. Have you ever seen a pine tree in your country? Where can you find them? And then the students will say, oh, pine trees grow in the park or something like this. So defining, using, eliciting. Those might appear in different orders. For example, you might use it first and then define it and then elicit. But those three elements should always be part of your, um, your routine, your vocabulary teaching routine. It's also very uh, important, especially for kind of intermediate or upper intermediate students, to get them to try to define words themselves. Um, this is very critical because it starts to build their autonomy as, as learners. Autonomy here means their independence. They become independent learners. Also, it, it builds up their vocabulary skills. What you're asking them to do is look at the word, the structure of the word, or the context of the word, and define it themselves, pick up on the clues and define it themselves. And so you're asking them to practice, um, practice using their vocabulary skills. And it also builds up that web of meaning that we talked about before, the interrelation between all the words that they know. So they're building their kind of foundation of, of vocabulary. We talked a little bit before about spaced repetition when we're, when we're talking about present, presenting words. So uh, spaced repetition here means, you know, when you immediately after you learn something, you know, if somebody asks you, oh, what did you just learn five seconds ago? Of course, you're going to be able to recall it. But if they ask you the next day or if they ask you in three days, what's going to happen? Of course, over time, your retention of that information is, is decreasing very rapidly, actually. So after the words are, are learned, you want to repeat them in some form. You want to repeat them the next day or the next class, ideally within one, two days. I usually use like a 72-hour rule. They should see the word again within 72 hours. And then it should be reviewed several times over the next week or, or a few days. One very easy way to do that is after you teach a set of vocabulary, just have a dictation the next class. Start class with a dictation. It doesn't have to be for all of the words, but you know, giving them, just getting into the routine of having a dictation for five, five minutes every class gets them to focus on reviewing the words at home, and that's going to naturally give them spaced repetition for, for review. The purpose here is, you know, the more exposure they have, the more exposure they have to the word, the greater the chances of retention. That, I've, I've seen some statistics, like people need to see, you know, I, maybe this is just something that's on the internet. It might not have any research basis, but um, I've seen statistics like people need to use a word or see a word 12 times or 16 times. I don't know if there's any truth to that, but definitely 
more repetition means there's more chances that you know they'll see the word and they'll be awake and paying attention and I think it's that that really uh, lends itself to retention of vocabulary when they're awake and they're paying attention to the word and they're exposed to the word and they clearly understand it so the more times you repeat the word the more chances there are for that to happen we also talked about um, different kinds of practice that you can do from moving from more restricted use activities where the language is very controlled and predictable to more authentic use activities so things like Restricted use activities would be things like labeling a picture, matching pictures to different items, classifying items into different lists, filling in the blanks, drill practice, crosswords or other kinds of word puzzles like word finds and things like that. More authentic use, things that you would learn, you would move to sort of after they've done a, a little bit of restricted use would be things like discussions or discussion questions or role-playing, or surveys, or interviews, or debates, or information exchanges, or communicative activities. So using both kinds of practice, first restricted use and then moving to authentic use, gives them opportunities to both use the words in, in a controlled environment and, and also for expressing their ideas. Excuse me for a minute. So the last point that I wanted to focus on, we've talked about sort of the right words to teach. We've also talked about um, practices or effective teaching practices for vocabulary. The third point I wanted to talk about is vocabulary skills. So what do I mean by vocabulary skills? I don't know about your students, but um, my students, and my children also really don't like reading, unfortunately. I would say out of 10 students, maybe I've got one or two that like, actually like reading, enjoy reading. Um, and if I think about the, the reason for that, I think the main reason is they just struggle to understand. They struggle to understand what, what they're reading, the words on the page. And I think native speakers, over time, you know, once people get into reading and they get into the practice of reading, they pick up some skills that they use subliminally, that without even thinking about it, to kind of decipher the meaning of a word. So, you know, if, if, if you think about it, if you always had to look up words in the dictionary, if you didn't have those kinds of subliminal skills, and every time you found a new word in a, in, a, in a passage, you had to look it up. Yeah, reading wouldn't be very much fun for you either, unless you love reading the dictionary. So I think those subliminal skills are things that we should teach as teachers. We should be aware of them. We should be aware of those skills. And we should give students an opportunity to learn them as well. It's going to improve the experience of reading for your students. And it's going to also enhance language learning in general. It's going to, those, those skills are going to bleed into their listening comprehension, also their speaking and their writing. So think about how, how we decipher a new word. I'm going to open this up for ideas from our audience. So when you're reading, when you're reading a word, how do you figure out you know, when you're reading and there's like a new word and you don't know the meaning, how do you figure it out? Not using a dictionary, how do you figure out the meaning? I'll just give you a few minutes to write, write your ideas. I guess everybody's shy or quiet.
context clues usually right using online dictionary well that's also a dictionary how about if you if you don't have access to a dictionary how do you figure out the meaning of the word context prefix Louise says for guessing the meaning I think context is best right context and we're going to talk a little bit about what that means you know what we mean by context So there's three kind of main clues. If we think of, you know, deciphering the meaning of a new word as, as sort of picking up on clues and putting the clues together, just like a detective, you know. There's, there's actually many different clues that we, can, that we use subliminally as native speakers. We use them to, to understand the meaning of a new word. So they, we can basically group them into three categories. Structure clues, context clues, and knowledge clues. So I'm going to talk about those three and I'm going to give you some examples. So structure clues, what we mean is if we just look at the word itself in isolation, there's some parts of the words, especially in what we call Latinate words. Latin, you know, builds words from prefixes and roots and suffixes and it kind of joins them together like Lego bricks. So we can piece together the meaning of the word from, from those, if we know the meaning of those individual Lego bricks, we can piece together the meaning. But also we can get clues like the part of speech or the, the objects, the agent. So um, let's look at a couple of examples. So the cat lay on the floor purring contentedly in the sun. Let's say you're a lower level student, you don't know the word contentedly. You might know the part of speech though, you might be able to figure out, oh it's purring, contentedly is modifying con purring, so it's obviously an adverb, so it's that clue, maybe it doesn't give you the, the whole meaning, but it gives you an, a small clue about the meaning, like it's a way of doing something, it's a way of purring. So that gives you a little clue. So the part of speech, whether it's a noun, a verb, an adjective, or an adverb, that can give you one piece of the puzzle. Also, the, the agents, the agent, for example, if it's, a, if it's a verb, the agents of that verb can give you a clue, or the recipients of the action, or the objects, or the reference. Let's take an, another example. So each summer, Thousands of tourists flock to the beaches of Cape Cod. So here, flock is what? It's a, it's a verb. So, tourists are doing something. A verb means it's an action. So they're doing something, and we look at the, the object, to the beaches. They're flocking to the beaches. So we can kind of guess what that means. It means going together. Maybe we also know that flock has a meaning as a noun, which means a group of birds. So it means to move in a group, that's what it means. Okay, so structure clues could be the part of speech, the, the objects and the agents of the, of the word. They could also be the morphology of the word. That's what we talked about before in reference to the, uh, the Latinate words. So that means the word structure. So here's a really hard word, sonambulist. The sonambulist was locked in his bedroom at night for safety. Well, I guess most people who are not native speakers wouldn't know what that means, sonambulist. But maybe we know IST, that suffix, means a person, like violinist or artist. That means a person, so it's a kind of person. And son, maybe we have seen, seen this in other words, but probably ambula, ambula means like moving around, and like ambulance. Ambulance is a, a car to move people, especially sick people. So sonambulist here means a person who moves around in their sleep. That's what it means. So actually, if we were teaching this word, heaven forbid, if we were teaching this word to our students, we could teach IST as a suffix. We could also teach 
Ambula means moving, and Som means sleep. So you, could, you can use these context clues, like the affixations, the, the, sub, the prefixes and the suffixes. You can also use compounding. So for example, thunderstorm. Thunderstorm means a storm with thunder. Bus stop means the, the place where the bus stops. So compound, compounding can also be part of the word structure that gives clues. Also conversion. We talked about um, flock before, right? Flock as, an, as a verb, flock as a noun. They can kind of give each other, they can kind of reinforce the meaning of each other. So for example, to cook a meal and a cook. Cook a meal, maybe you know what that means. And a cook means a person who does that. Also, the derivations, so the different forms that it takes, the different forms that a word takes. So we can use all of these things as structure clues. The second category is context clues. So context clues, lots of people in our comment section said context is the main thing that they focus on. So what do we mean by context? So context means sort of the words around that unknown word. Let's say we don't know what a dudin is, for example. The dudin, a short-stemmed clay pipe, is found in Irish folklore, folktales, sorry. So we don't know what a dudin is, but luckily the, the author, the writer of the sentence, gave us the clue right in the sentence. Sometimes authors do this, especially for very technical words or words that they, know, they are quite sure that we don't know. So they give us a definition. That's one kind of context clue. Another kind is a synonym. So let's look at this example. A beaver uses its front, big front teeth to cut trees and branches. These incisors continue to grow throughout the animal's life. Well, in English, Writers don't like to repeat the same word over and over again because it's, it's boring. So they often use a synonym to replace a particular noun. So um, in this case, incisor, we don't know the word incisor, but we can look to the previous sentence and there's a synonym right there. So the big front teeth, those are incisors. That's exactly what it means, okay? So sometimes there are synonyms used in the text that can give us clues for the meaning of the word. Another kind of context clue is example. This could either be um, the superordinate. Superordinate here means the umbrella term that is uh, under which other examples are related, or it could be the word that we don't know could be one of the subterms and the superordinate is given. For example, types of vegetation like leaves and grass, right? Giraffes feed on leaves, grass, and other vegetation. So the superordinate here is the one that we don't know, which is vegetation. But we, we know the examples, leaves, grass, so we can kind of figure out the meaning of, of vegetation. Another kind of context clues is antonyms or contrast. A text might present a contrasting idea or give a word that has an opposite meaning and that might help us to understand the meaning of an unknown word. Take a look at this example. Unlike animals that are active during the day, the bat, like other nocturnal animals, is well adapted to the dark. I'm sorry, I made a mistake there. Is well adapted to the dark. So nocturnal is the word that we don't know. We can look for a contrastive term. So a bat is a nocturnal animal, and it says unlike. Unlike is a big clue word for, for contrast, right? So unlike animals that are active during the day. So active during the day is the contrast. So what does nocturnal mean? It means active during the night. So looking for words like unlike, but, these kinds of words. Another kind of context clue 
is related to mood or tone. This is more in, in fiction than in nonfiction. But um, you know, if we if we see a, 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 a passage that's very kind of light and happy, or dark and brooding, or kind of you know scary, the um, that tone can kind of give us some very very general clue about the meaning of the word. So, for example, we had a sense of foreboding as we neared the old dark house. So the, the kind of the mood of the sentence is very dark and scary, ominous. So we can kind of guess that foreboding is not a positive word. It's not, it's not, it doesn't mean happiness or joy. So mood or tone. The last context clue I wanted to focus on was about cause and effect. Sometimes we see in a passage or in a sentence cause and effect relationships where we can help, we can use those to uh, help us to understand the meaning of an unknown word. So for example, the door was ajar, so the dog got out of the house. Well, in this case, we understand the, the meaning of the effect, but the unknown word is in the cause. The door was ajar. Well, something caused the dog to get out. What would that be? The door was something. The door was a little bit open. That was, that, that was the problem. So we could ask our students to guess that. Because they understand the, 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 what the effect was, that's going to help them to understand what the, what the cause was. And that's going to give them a clue about what a jar means. Okay, the last type of clue is knowledge clues. So we talked about Structure clues. Structure means the part of speech or the, the form of the word, the morphology of the word. We talked about context clues, words that are around the, the unknown word that can help us to understand the meaning in some general way. The third type is knowledge clues. What does that mean? That means things in our own personal experience or our general knowledge that we have as we approach a topic um, that help us to understand the meaning of a new word. That's why it's really important when we, um, when we uh, start a reading passage, we should kind of preview and lead into the topic. We should kind of activate what we call activate schema. Activate schema means kind of remind students what they already know about this topic. That's important because it's going to help them to kind of frame or um, give them a, a framework in which to put those new words and that's going to help them to understand them more easily. Let's look at some examples. She smoothed it into place over her hips, added a belt, glanced at the mirror and left for work. What does glanced mean? Let's, let's pretend we don't know what that word means. Well, I guess every, definitely every woman, every person who, who dresses and cares about their appearance also would know what glance means just from their own experience what you do every morning so do you stare into the mirror how do you look into the mirror maybe if you're the, the wicked witch in Snow White you stare into the mirror but most people just glance into the mirror that means just to kind of look briefly So using our personal experience or our kind of common sense, the common sense that everybody has based, based on their lifestyle, um, we can use that to figure out the, word of a mean, uh, the meaning of a word. Also, our background knowledge. Maybe we know a little bit about a topic. This really depends on the, the age of your students, but maybe we know a, a little bit about a topic from our, our native language, and that can help us to figure out the meaning of new words. For example, stress can lead to hypertension and other serious health problems. Well, hypertension is a very advanced vocabulary, but you know, maybe we know a little bit about what health problems stress causes, things like heart problems, maybe you can have stroke, blood problems. So all of these serious health problems we know from our own reading on the topic or things that we've heard. So that can help us to understand what hypertension might mean. 
So we have these three kinds of vocabulary skills that we should find opportunities to, to expose our students to. Structure clues, the parts of speech, agent object referent, also the morphology of the word. Context clues like direct definition, synonym, example, antonym or contrast, the mood or the tone of the passage cause and effect relationships, and knowledge clues, things from our own personal experience, common sense, or background knowledge. So using all these, these clues, I don't think that most people use just one in isolation. I think what we do is subliminally we kind of combine bits of information from all of these clues to, to un understand in a very general way the meaning of new words. So hopefully you can give your students opportunities to practice these skills. And if you're aware of them as a teacher, you can kind of manipulate the situation a little bit to present opportunities to do that. I wanted to shift now to talk a little bit about um, our, our vocabulary build-up series. We, um, at Compass, we put together three different series of books to help students and teachers to teach vocabulary in the classroom, to, to really focus on vocabulary intensively. So there's uh, 1,000 basic English words, that's four books with uh, 12 units per level, and it runs from uh, pre-A1 to B1 level. There's the 2,000 level series that runs from uh, A1 plus to B1 level, and it's also four books, this time with 16 units per level. And then there's the 4000 series. 4000 series is six books, and it covers from A2 to C1, so quite up to quite advanced vocabulary level. The, uh, the one that I wanted to just give you a walkthrough of is, the, this is from the 2000 series, so I just wanted to kind of generally introduce you to the, a unit. So it starts with a list of words. In general, there's uh, 10, 10 words that are introduced, and they're all related to some theme. So the words are presented with uh, pronunciation keys, so we use the simple IPA symbols to, to help students understand the meaning. But there's also audio, so they can scan the QR code in the uh, upper right-hand corner of the next page to get the audio for all of those words in British English and American English. There's also a simple definition. Like I said, it's not a dictionary definition. It's enough to get them to understand the basic meaning of the word. There's also a support picture and a, a sentence, a ex simple example sem sentence that's related to the picture. So by putting those pieces of information together, they can understand the meaning of the word more deeply. We also added some ways of expanding vocabulary by, we added um, synonyms and antonyms in the, uh, on the right-hand side of, the, of the, uh, the list. On the next page, so after they study the list, you could assign that for pre, pre, previewing, and then there's, a, there's some exercises. So the exercises run from, um, very restricted use activities, like in this case, they're matching the vocabulary with the definition, and they're doing like some, some fill in the blank activity. They're, they're choosing the best word to fit the, the blank. Then there's a second set of vocabulary related to the same theme, and then there's another set of, uh, of activities that are related to that second list. So all together in one unit, they're learning uh, 20 words, and they're, they're all related to the same theme, and they're learning them sort of in two batches. So it depends how much time you want to spend on vocabulary learning, but you could split that into several classes, or you could do it in one class. Then there's a passage that uses many of those words in, in the context of, uh, that's in a context that's related to the same theme. And we tried to make those readings as realistic as possible. So in this case, they learned all about health and illness, and they're going to learn about some kind of common home remedies for 
you know, solving problems like headaches and upset stomach. And there's different kinds of con uh, formats that those readings are in as well. Then there's reading comprehension questions. And then they're given uh, opportunities to use the vocabulary as well in a kind of more authentic way. That's in the extension activities. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, but I wanted to open up the, uh, the forum to any kind of questions that you might have or any questions that you had about how to teach vocabulary, what words to teach, vocabulary skills, or about the, uh, the products that we talked about. Any questions at all? Were there any questions that came up during the presentation? Well, if there's no questions, you can always use the Google form at the, um, in the description of the video. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found this useful. And I hope you come back for our other uh, webinars in the future. I'm going to be giving another one at the end of the month on a different topic. So I hope to see you then. Thank you very much.